Welcome everyone. It's a pleasure that you're all joining us for this uh, regional hub story sharing session. I'm Emma Ewan. I'm the Impact and Translation Lead for CRC Time. And um, today is obviously the first day of our first conference for CRC Time. Just before we start, I'd like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners um, on the land we meet. I'm personally on the Wajak Dungna country, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands from which you are all joining us today. And in particular, I'd like to um, particularly welcome Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people who might be joining us today. So what I'll be um, talking about today is there'll be a, a I'll give a, pro, a brief um, introduction on regional hubs. Then we will have five speakers from all across the country speaking to you and sharing their stories around um, what's happening in the regions. And then we'll have a Q&A session. So what is a hub? Well, a hub is really a group of people. It brings together um, people across diverse sectors, including our six colleges, um, which is mining, METs, uh, government, uh, regional development, indigenous groups. And for those hubs that we have, we have a secretariat, which is usually three to four people who help coordinate and facilitate um, meetings, which we have usually around twice a year. And also there's also linkages into other sectors, you know, NRM is one example, but also we're particularly interested in linking in with indigenous networks as well. Now the goal of the hubs is twofold. It's both to deliver good research on the one hand, as well as supporting this more longer term um, post mine regional development. And the balance between those will shift through time. So in the early days, it's really going to strongly focus on the research. So making sure that the research is um, more uh, locally relevant and also feeding back the findings in the research. But through time, we will head towards a, a longer term transformation across the 10 years of which CRC time will be functioning. Now, the hubs are located, as I mentioned, across Australia. Um, the ones in green are the ones we have already established and we'll have speakers speaking around these regions today, so Southwest WA, the Pilbara, Northern Territory, Bowen Basin in Queensland, and the Trobe Valley. But we also have a lot of interest in um, developing hubs in the future in South Australia, Hunter Valley, as well as um, a lot of interest from partners in the gold fields, the Northwest Province in Queensland, as well as Northwest Tasmania. And in terms of progress so far for the hubs, um, you can sort of see that on the in the first column there that most of the hubs have had one or two meetings. Um, the dates are illustrated. Now the hubs are all can be quite different in each area. So for example, um, Pilbara, Bowen and Southwest will have quite discrete hubs that will be established by the CRC time. In um, the Northern Territory, we will be linking in with the Gove Peninsula Futures Reference Group. Um, and in La Trobe, um, whilst we are establishing a hub, we will be working very closely with the Mine Land Rehabilitation Authority. Um, and in most of the hub regions, we have already introduced the research priority areas and we have asked them um, what sort of ideas they would like to see um, represented in CRC time research. Um, through this session, as I mentioned, we will have a Q&A session at the end. So hopefully we'll have 20, 30 minutes for that. But I strongly encourage you to use the live chat function. So um, it should be on the right hand side, depending on which view it is. And I'll be a strip up the top or a list down the side. But if you could use the Q&A chat function to ask questions. Uh, after each of the speakers, if there's clarifying questions, I'll ask a question of that speaker. If there's um, sort of a more general discussion, I'll, I'll probably wait till the end. And um, if you could also just sort of put the name of the person um, to whom you would like to address the question, that would be really helpful for me to direct questions during the Q&A. There is also a discussion forum, which is not monitored, but um, really support and welcome you to use that to sort of connect with other people that might be in the room for sort of more of an informal chat process. Um, Sorry, that something weird happened there. <laughs> uh, the presenters today, um, we've got, as I've said, we've got from the Bowen Basin, we've got from Pilbara and um, Gove and the Trobe Valley. Um, the, oh, there we go. Sorry, I lost you for a minute there. Um, our first speaker is Peter Dowling. He leads the um, Central Highlands Development Corporation 
um, management and delivery of the um, Central Highlands Economic Master Plan. Uh, Peter has um, a background in regional development, community relations, corporate affairs, vocational education, as well as having worked closely with universities and local government. So I hand you over to Peter. Hi, it's Peter Dowling here from Emerald in central Queensland uh, as a member of the Bowen Basin Regional Hub. And uh, today I'm on Western Kangaroo country. Um, just wanted to share with you a, uh, a bit of an overview map wise of the region. Um, a mix of communities there from uh, large centres like Mackay, uh, smaller centres like Emerald, Moorumbah and Blackwater um, and a real mix and type. And our commodities are, are quite standard, um, resource orientated, agriculture, horticulture or the like. And diversity across the region in terms of its industry structure is uh, mixed and varied as well. Um, our larger community like Mackay has greater diversity. Uh, the emeralds of the world have a couple of industries of note. Uh, beyond that, they tend to be single driven communities. Uh, just thought we'd share this slide to give you a sense of the makeup of the Bowen Basin Hub and also the Queensland CRC Time partners. Regarding the mine closures and what's up and coming from what we can see, um, you're looking at around about 30 operating mines in the Bowen Basin to start with, uh, a high level of direct economic contribution. Um, there's a time frame set there of about 2040 to 2070 um where we particularly think the spikes will occur with mine closure and we've got some examples there of uh the interesting mix of mines that are going from care and maintenance back into operations uh often on the back of small miners um, taking over from large globals and then we do have some that are in care and maintenance or moving towards it the barriers are um are many and varied, uh, again, back to that very little other industry. So that diversity is a concern. And um, it's hard for these communities to uh, imagine a future without mining in its current state. Um, as a hub, uh, another barrier is that we're very, very green. So we're new to this and uh, it's early days. Um, the transformation approach is really interesting. So there's a mindset now around closure and post mining land use and it's seen in a futuristic sort of challenge responsibility and cost um, whereas that transformation approach of doing things progressively and from now onwards is uh, probably one of the barriers we see uh, of others as opposed to regions um, importantly the research focus is um, is different for us in regions so we see from a region outwards and um, we want more than just delivering frameworks, reviews, audits and tools. We'd love to see how that can be um, turned into gains for regional value and uh, look forward to that opportunity or you know, redressing that barrier in our mind. And then there's that, that journey of um, collaboration within regions and beyond regions. So we have a variety of boundaries that are you know, based on government boundaries and industry and natural resource management, and we need to move forward uh, to get some outcomes there. Opportunities are many. Um, we're world leaders in coal mining. We can be world leaders in transformation. Uh, there's opportunities to build on the infrastructure and the strengths of existing industry and value adding. Um, METs, ag tech, mine tech, critical minerals, uh, utilising mine affected water. Um, building in region capability and capacity to go forward really, really important uh, as opposed to um, bringing it in all the time. Uh, setting positive precedents, um, we need to look at that challenge of what's good for a region uh, may require some real um, interesting discussions around the change of regulatory uh, legislation, industry need and want, etc. cetera. Um, we think the hub is a great opportunity in itself to network across boundaries and also to value add. We want to value add to uh, the informing of uh, plans and strategies that are taking place. And finally, there's a quick uh, engine residual void study uh, that's been done in a foundation project 
And um, that's one of those potentials to turn what could be seen as a, a regulatory holdup into um, something that could be beneficial to a region. Look forward to catching up with all uh, in the Q&A session. Cheers. Um, really interesting to hear what the Q&A session um, brings up. Um, so please don't forget to post your questions in the live Q&A um, section. Uh, our next speaker is Michael Heap. He's um, the Director of Regional Economic Development at the Pilbara Development Commission. Uh, he has an extensive career in research analytics and is an advocate for evidence-based decision-making and the use of data and analytics to deliver innovative outcomes. Over to you, Michael. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Heap. I'm the Director of Regional Development for the Pilbara Development Commission. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about the, uh, the Pilbara Regional Hub. So a little bit about the Pilbara first. We're a very, very large region in um, northern WA. We've got a, about 500,000 square kilometres of area. And that's about, to put that in perspective, it's about twice the size of the state of Victoria or maybe about the same size as France or Spain. Uh, we've um, got four local government areas within that and uh, a number of towns as well, a number of population centres. Uh, within the Pilbara, we've got uh, quite a number of CRC members and partners in operating ourselves, of course, a number of educational institutions that have a presence up here, the local governments themselves, and of course, a number of the major miners operate out of the Pilbara. Uh, and we're talking about transformations in mining economies today, so I'll tell you a little bit about the Pilbara economy. Um, we've got a, a GRP of $62 billion. It's increased quite significantly over the, the last 12 to 24 months. Uh, obviously, there's a, a huge mining uh, focus within that. So um, we have iron ore sales of over $100 billion go out of the Pilbara and 40, sorry, high 30s to $40 billion worth of oil and gas is, is exported out of the ports um, along our coastline. Uh, and also about a, nearly a billion dollars worth of gold as well that you may not know. Um, very, very healthy employment sector. We've got 63,000 jobs in the region. About half of those people live in the region. Uh, the other half will fly in, fly out. Uh, but a very low unemployment rate, just under 2% now. That's the, the June figure that you'll see on the screen there. Uh, but we're now under 2% and it's probably the lowest in, in WA, certainly. Uh, and a significant number of job ads which are unable to be filled. Um, there's a skill shortage across the state and across the nation. And we, uh, we feel that very, very much in the Pilbara. Uh, just the final point I'll make on that is around the exports. Um, we have about a 40% share of national exports, but within the, the goods element of, uh, of what Australia exports, over 50% of the dollars that, that Australia takes in because of that comes out of the Pilbara. So uh, we are a major, major component of the, um, the livelihoods and the, the, the lifestyle that we live um, in Australia is because of what comes out of the Pilbara region. So when we're talking um, the transformation, for us, this is not a story of mine closure. Um, we have our existing industries and historical industries like pastoralism, gold, iron ore, oil and gas. We see those continuing. Certainly, we've got another 100 years of worth of mining of iron ore in the region. But what we're seeing in our transformation is around that diversification. We've got the rise of critical minerals like gold, copper, nickel, cobalt, manganese, lithium. Uh, they're all found in the Pilbara and with the increasing reliance on batteries and technology, uh, these critical minerals become even more important and we're seeing a lot of investment into those industries. We've got a pipeline of investment of over $170 billion worth of CapEx, which is forecast to be invested into projects in the region over the next 10 years. That'll bring a significant amount of new jobs. Uh, and they're really, uh, and like the key for us is that diversification of jobs. It's not just your miners, it's not just your oil and gas anymore. I mean, the, the, um, the renewable sector, for example, the industrial electrification of, of mines, uh, you may have seen Rio Tinto committed to more than a billion dollars worth of investment to uh, transition their current operations in the Pilbara to renewables. Uh, we're seeing that from many different miners, and we're also seeing significant investments from, um, from operators looking to 
produce and export green hydrogen and green ammonia out of the region. So these are uh, huge emerging industries for us that we're, we're trying to keep across of uh, and understand what they're going to do for our economies and our communities, um, as well as um, manufacturing using that sort of that cheaper renewable energy um, and manufacturing for the generation of that energy. So that real diversification is our story right now, as opposed to a, a story of mine closure. A little bit about the hub. So we, uh, a number of CRC members attended those sort of those early information sessions and we spoke extensively around the challenges that the region has. Um, there's, we all had involvement in quite a number of the foundational projects as well that have been going on over the last sort of year, year and a half. But the Pilbara is a very, very busy place as all your other regions would be. And it's very difficult to get people together without that real specific driving purpose. So. We needed a hook to bring people on that journey. That's why we've been developing um, a project which is specifically focused on the Pilbara. Uh, and what we're trying to do is understand the cumulative impact of that $170 billion that I just showed you uh, and what that diversified investment means for this region. Um, the, the partners in that project will essentially form the hub um, and we're going through the, the process of submitting that proposal right now. So I'll talk to you about that cumulative impact and what that means for us. Uh, so we see the, the impact of, of this money um, being spent in the region uh, and the diversification of this money and the skills that are needed to enable these projects as, as having multiple impacts. Um, the social one is a great example in terms of how can our region capture the opportunities that come with that? Um, what do our communities need to do to benefit, to, to have more of these people living in their communities? Uh, what does the housing market need to look like? What does the education offering need to look like? What does the uh, the health offering need to look like? What do what does what do our, our local governments need to do to position themselves in the best possible front to take advantage of all that investment? Uh, and also the the economic impact. So what does a what does a transition from a reliance on mining to a more diversified economy actually look like? Where are the opportunities to enable that for government, to, for ourselves to enable that? And where are the barriers that we'll need to break down in that process? What new industries will emerge off the back of this that if they have a little sort of uh, encouragement, um, they could actually prosper in this time. Um, that's what we're trying to understand with this work. And the, the other opportunity that's an obvious one for us is, is around those, that renewable space and hydrogen. And there'll be a significant amount of research uh, through the CRC that we're hopeful for that will that will play into that space and will inform that space for us. Um, there's, as I spoke about, there's this significant shareholder pressure on existing resource operators in our region to invest in electrification of their operations and using renewable sources to, to fund that electrification. Uh, and there's also, like I said, again, there's a number of operators who are exploring what this new energy means and the export of this new energy means. So, uh, and why the Pilbara? We have some of the highest solar radiance in the world. We've got high wind capacity factors, especially at night, which is perfect for renewable generation. We're very, very close to key Asian trading partners, and we all already have those existing relationships through the business that we've been doing for the past yeah, 50 years. Uh, we've also got the established infrastructure and export capacity to actually, um, to actually enable that to take place. Uh, and the skills, the transferable skills within our current industries are very, um, are very useful in these emerging industries as well. So it's a, it's an area that we're spending a significant amount of time trying to understand uh, and do our part to enable that. The, the state government has recently announced their support for a, a hydrogen hub within the Pilbara. And, I'm very happy to say that the commission was one of the driving forces behind that as well. So uh, uh, furthering our knowledge uh, and gaining more information around this new industries and these new opportunities is critical to us. So we're looking forward to our ongoing partnership with the CRC to enable that. Thank you very much and um, look forward to answering any questions. Cheers. Um, great to hear about all the um, energy and innovation happening in the Pilbara. Um, there is a question, um, particularly with regards to um, the hydrogen um, opportunities that you mentioned, and the question was, what sources of water um, will be used for the production of that? Michael, are you able to answer that question, please? 
Uh, absolutely. I guess it was very much project dependent. Um, if, if it's a coastal generation, you can see opportunities in desalination. But I, I do see uh, major opportunities in, in mine deep water, um, mining pits that have that below the water table, uh, and mines that we know that are going to be below the water table when they're planning for their sort of post mine life. Um, yeah, utilizing that water for the electrolysis and creating hydrogen on site makes perfect, perfect sense. So uh, I guess it depends on where it is. Uh, aquifers, if they're in existence nearby as well, makes sense. But certainly from a, a mine dewater water perspective, there's a huge opportunity there for post mine land use, turning into renewables and hydrogen generation. Great, thanks a lot, Michael. Um, our next speaker is going to be Jim Rogers. Um, he's with the East Arnhem Regional, oh, sorry, he's um, he's with DEAL. Oh, sorry, no, he's with the East Arnhem Regional Executive Director for the Northern Territory Government in the Department of um, the Chief Minister and Cabinet. He leads a, a small, multidisciplinary, regionally based team who focus on working with regional communities to diversify and grow their regional economy. Um, as well as supporting Aboriginal businesses and industry development and strengthening services to improve socioeconomic outcomes for this very remote, very beautiful and culturally rich region of Australia, which um, myself and Fiona were fortunate enough to visit um, earlier this year. Over to you, Jim. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to present today. My name is Jim Rogers and I'm the Regional Executive Director for the Department of the Chief Minister and Cabinet here in East Arnhem Land in Nullumboy. Today I'll be talking to you about the Gove Peninsula transition, but I also just before starting want to acknowledge the CRC time partners from Northern Territory, including South 32, Newmont and Rio Tinto, and our regional partners here developing East Arnhem Land, CSIRO, Natural Territory Natural Resource Management. And as part of the Gove Hub, Ruritingu Aboriginal Corporation, Gumach Corporation, Northern Land Council and the Australian Government. So a little bit about East Arnhem Land and the Gove Peninsula. Uh, 33,000 square kilometres of Aboriginal land, which means development is by consent. There are two major mining operations in the region which have been here since the 60s and 70s. The Rio Tinto Bauxite operation here on the peninsula and Good Island um, manganese mine, the Genco mine, um, operated by South 32. Um, on the Go Peninsula and in the Grid Archipelago, we have two emerging uh, TO led mining operations in the Gulkula mine and Winchelsea Island mining project for the ALC. The region's around 16,000 people population um, here on the Go Peninsula, around 4,000 people in the Nullumboy regional hub, about a thousand people in Aliangula, sub-regional hub, and then there are nine major communities and many, many more homelands, of which the total population is around 10,000 people. The regional economy is dominated by the mining sector, with about $1.7 billion in output in 2019, uh, but we are seeing increasingly emerging um, sectors in healthcare, uh, human services, education, training, public administration, but uh, more importantly, I suppose, in the private sector, in the tourism, forestry, and more recently, aerospace. So a little bit about the story so far. So in 2014, Rio Tinto, uh, announced the go of curtailment of the refinery, about 1,100 jobs were lost, and there was a significant economic shock here on the peninsula, around half the population leaving town, and um, serious industry and community concerns about the future of Nullumboy as a regional hub. Uh, Rio Tinto Northern Territory Government put in place a very strong structural adjustment package and through that work have achieved uh, quite an extraordinary outcome of the town rebounding to its pre curtailment levels of population, but most importantly, uh, quite a strong diversification of the economy here on the Gove Peninsula in particular. So during that time, as I said, we had uh, we started work on our diversification strategies um, in partnership with regional stakeholders. And most recently, our shift 
uh, has been to start the planning for a post-mining economy and to support the closure processes that need to happen between here and there. At this stage, around 2029 is the, uh, or 2030, uh, we're expecting um, mining to have um, completed here in the peninsula. So governance is really important. We've established the Gove Peninsula Futures Reference Group. Um, you can see the organisation as part of that. Uh, it was in 2019, um, it's been working very strongly since then on the transition processes. And under that now, we've established a number of key work streams, which will take care of a lot of the complex tasks that need to be undertaken to get it, to achieve a successful transition. Uh, land tenure, economic development and transition, including housing, economic, uh, sorry, essential services and infrastructure, community and government services. And the terms of reference for those have been settled, including who's in those work streams, the type of work that we need to get done or the objectives, and what we need to achieve and by when. Uh, there are two additional work streams that we're working on. Uh, the Yungwon Nakapi Together story, which is a story about having a really successful integrated community into the future, and the town governance story, which relates to local government. So the most important task that the Futures Group has been working on over the past 12 to 18 months is supporting the traditional owners to articulate a really clear vision for the future. Northern Boy and surrounds and the mining areas are Aboriginal land and the traditional owners will make decisions about the future of those areas. So if you like, think about traditional owner vision as the policy setting for our work. And the TOs um, have articulated a very clear vision and I'll attempt here to articulate some of that. So the vision is to rejuvenate the region and it'll be a place for traditional owners to share culture, business and, and a business and services hub for Arnhem Land. TO's vision is to be a leading example of how Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people can live and work together successfully and in harmony. The principles for transition are also important part of this document and that the TO vision must be at the centre of all of our decisions. We'll work together with unity amongst clans and with Nakbi or non-Indigenous people. The TOs should start making decisions now to create certainty with the future. And the transition should create opportunities and not problems for you all in particular, and empowering young people as future leaders and thinking in new ways. So I won't go through this in detail, but you can see here on the slide, there are a range of key focus areas or directions that the traditional owners want us to deliver and that we'll work in partnership to do so. Public accountability is really important. Our uh, Go Potential Futures Reference Group has now published a plan on a page for the next 18 months or so. And again, I won't go through this in detail, but what this gives us is uh, a way to provide some certainty to industry, to investors and to communities around what we're doing and when. So just some of the opportunities that we're looking to achieve. Uh, the Gove Port is an only natural deep water harbour between here, uh, sorry, between Darwin and Cairns. Um, it has um, significant opportunity for new industry, uh, to, including repurposing a range of existing mining assets, wharves, fuel tanks, lay down areas, administrative facilities, warehouses, um, which of many of which um, have a future economic value for industry. And some of the industries that we already are aware of, are, are aware of is uh, uh, defence, water protection, um, fisheries and aquaculture, uh, yachting, expeditionary cruise, cruises, all of those things we expect to grow over the coming years. The second key asset is our city standard airport, uh, which has um, serviced the region well for many years and will do so for many years to come. Uh, again, industries, um, well, it supports a whole range of industries having that capability into the future, but in particular, um, we expect defence and other industries, um, regional border protection, surveillance, search and rescue to be a key feature beyond mining. And lastly, in terms of um, development potential, is that the extant infrastructure here on the Gove Peninsula has paved the way for the development of the Arnhem Space Centre. Um, some of you might see in the news that uh, NASA is preparing a launch campaign for 2021, 2022, I should say. 
and are well advanced in their planning to do that. The infrastructure is being built out at the moment. Um, and all of these things are only possible because of the types of investments that mining have brought over the years to the peninsula. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to present today um, and look forward to taking your questions later. Thanks, Jim. Um, I particularly found those space industry opportunities really interesting. Um, now, the next speaker is going to be Ray uh, McKay, who's the former commissioner of La Trobe Valley Mine Rehabilitation. At, um, he's the former commissioner and he's the current chair of Victoria's Mine Land Rehabilitation Authority. His extensive mine rehabilitation experience, um, as well as being a practicing engineer, a hydrogeologist and an academic. Thank you, Ray. Hello, my name is Ray Mackay. I'm the chair of the Mineland Rehabilitation Authority. I'm going to provide a very brief presentation on the Trobe Valley and the Latrobe Valley Hub. Uh, I uh, am producing this presentation today uh, from the uh, traditional lands of the Gunai Kurna. The Trobe Valley is located about 150 kilometres southeast of Melbourne in Victoria. The three Mines of interest in this region are the brown coal mines, Hazelwood, Yolon, and Loyang. They're located close to Latrobe City, and they're located on the Latrobe River, which flows towards the Gippsland Lakes. Thermal power generation has been a major feature of this region since the 1920s, because we sit on the world's largest deposit of brown coal. The three mines are located close to urban infrastructure and regionally energy, food and fibre industries dominate. We have typically good water resources, but those are potentially going to reduce in the future due to climate change. The city has a population of 75,000. The Gippsland Lakes are Ramsar listed, they're the largest estuarine lagoon system in Australia, uh, and they are increasingly impacted by reduced inflows and drying conditions, and therefore any use of water by the Latrobe Valley mines has potential to impact uh, on the uh, uh, Gippsland Lakes. Hazelwood mine closed in 2017. Recently, we learned that uh, Yalon mine would bring forward its date for closure until 2028. The longest running mine uh, will be Loyang. Uh, it's planned to continue mining until 2048 and may go longer than that, but depending on the energy transition for Victoria, uh, it may also uh, uh, cease power uh, production uh, earlier than that period. It's appropriate to note that the uh, rehabilitation and closure plans for all of the uh, uh, mines in terms of implementation may uh, uh, run for about 20 to 40 years, so very substantial uh, uh, advanced times. The CRC time partners who are involved in the Litro Valley Hub are Energy Australia, Federation University and the Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions. Invitees also include uh, the other power generators in the area, uh, other agencies and departments of government, uh, in addition to DJPR, uh, the City Council, uh, the Lotro Valley Authority that has a role in the transition for the region, and the water management, catchment management uh, companies uh, that are located here. Uh, we also include uh, uh, inputs from the Lotro Health Assembly uh, and from the Gunai Kanai. Uh, lands and Water Aboriginal Corporation, who are very important in the overall planning for rehabilitation in this region. The hub has been under development for a while. Uh, we had meetings in 2020 and our most recent meeting uh, uh, was in, in November. Uh, that meeting uh, was focused on the research projects that are being undertaken uh, through the CRC Time Foundation Research Project Program. Uh, and we were introduced to the project development cycle to develop new uh, research relevant to the region. 
That allows us to commence conversations around those regional research requirements uh, from which we got strong buy-in from the FTPs. Mining has been carried on for a long time in this area, uh, uh, and, but rehabilitation was really brought into focus following the Hazelwood mine fire in 2014 uh, and, and the inquiries that uh, subsequently followed in 2015 and 2016. The outcome of those were effectively the development of a regional rehabilitation strategy to look at the cumulative impacts of the uh, uh, three brown coal mines and to uh, develop an implementation plan that would actually allow uh, for good outcomes to be, uh, uh, to be uh, developed uh, for the region. That includes updates in regulations, updates in the way that government uh, facilitates and supports proponent -led rehabilitation, a higher focus on uh, uh, mine rehabilitation planning by the licensees, um, a special emphasis on resources allocation uh, to ensure that uh, uh, the impacts are uh, uh, appropriate to the uh, uh, planning processes, and my own authority uh, was developed and implemented oversee all of these processes. It's important to note that each of the three brown coal mines have a plan for a pit lake as the potentially most sustainable uh, and, and safe and stable outcome for the area uh, with the widest uh, range of potential opportunities for future use. Mine license areas cover a, uh, a total area of about 140 square kilometers. They're located within and along the boundary of the city uh, and they opportun open opportunities for excellent uh, uh, outcomes uh, for a whole range of diverse land uses. Basically, they will fit in to the uh, existing regional visions for the area. Uh, and those cover essentially four themes uh, built around tourism, livability and recreation, industry, business, commerce, agriculture, continuation of energy and uh, optimal use of the available water resources in the area. Overarching all of those will be services, education and training. So that brings uh, uh, that little brief introduction to a close and I look forward to uh, the conversations that follow. Thanks, Ray. Um, that was really interesting. And in particular, I think um, people in this forum will be really interested to watch and observe through the time as um, you as one of the um, four leaders, I guess, in this area progress um, your transition. Uh, the next speaker will be Pip Kirby. She's from the Southwest Development Commission. Um, and she played a, a key role in the transition of um, Collie's economy away from a reliance on coal fired power generation. Um, she's experienced in regional development stakeholder engagement, business development, intergovernmental coordination, project management and policy development. Thanks, Pip. Good afternoon. My name is Pip Kirby. And I'm a director for regional development for the Southwest Development Commission. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wilma Noongar people, the traditional owners of the land on which I'm sitting today. I'd like to um, pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. My role is based in Collie and is specifically focused on working to diversify the economy away from its current reliance on coal-fired power generation. So while I'm here to present on behalf of the Southwest Hub, excuse me if I lean heavily on my knowledge of the transformation we're currently seeing underway in Collie. I have to confess that my knowledge of the mining sector across the broader region is a little bit limited. So the Southwest WA Regional Hub covers a large portion of the Southwest Land Division, from an area up to Geraldton in the north to Bustleton in the south and east, just beyond Northern. Some key mining activity that's underway in the region. Um, Iluka Resources have mines at Nangaloo near Geraldton, Capel near Bustleton and at Caterby near Jandarrigan. Iluka and Doral Mineral Sands activities include mining and separation of ilmenite, zircon, natural rutile and monzonite, secondary processing of minerals into upgraded ilmenite and the manufacture of titanium dioxide pigment. There are two coal producers in the Collie area, including Yan Coal, otherwise known as Premier Coal, and Lanco Resources Australia, otherwise known as Griffin Coal. 
The state's power generation organisation, Synergy, uses the majority of the coal for electricity generation, with the remainder used by industry in the production of alumina, mineral sands, cement and nickel. Newman's Boddington Gold Mines, one of Australia's largest producing gold mines, Boddington produces gold and copper concentrate. Commercial production began in 2009, with closure anticipated around 2035. South 32 Worsley Alumina is one of the largest and lowest cost alumina producers in the world. South 32 produces bauxite, which is mined in Boddington and transported by conveyor to the refinery near Collie into Alumina. It was established in the 1980s with a life expectancy of at least, till at least 2035. The next phase of mining requires an environmental review, which was projected to be finalised in early 2022. Alcoa has been mining in the area for approximately 60 years and they own bauxite mines at Huntley near Dwelling Up and Willowdale in the Darling Range, south of Perth. They supply bauxite to alumina refineries at Quinana, Pinjarra and Wagerup. Alcoa is well advanced in rehabilitation and restoration techniques where 99% of the land is returned to forest. Restoration efforts at Huntley and Willowdale have been driven by tighter regulations, which resulted from public pressure and restoration technology advancements. Tallison's Lithium Limited Greenbushes Mine is one of the longest continuously operated mining areas in WA, with mining commencing following the discovery of tin in 1888. The subsequent discovery of tantalum and lithium deposits has seen the mine produce these commodities since 1983. The area is recognised as containing the world's highest grade and largest hard rock deposit of the lithium mineral spodumene. I'm sure there's other, others that I have missed, so my apologies to them. The economy of the southwest area, hub area is very diverse. Um, I'll just note that the figures that I have on my slide here are only indicative. They're drawn from the Regional Development Commission boundaries of the Peel and the southwest, and therefore they don't represent the entire region. The total economic output of the region is around 51.5 billion, with mining contributing 8.4% or 8.4 billion or 16% of the total value. Other significant contributing sectors are to economic output and manufacturing at 22% and construction at 13%. The area is home to the largest population base outside of metropolitan Perth, with more than 300,000 people residing in the region. In relation to workforce, mining delivers approximately 4.7% of the total jobs in the region. The healthcare, construction, manufacturing, tourism and agriculture sectors each generate a greater percentage of employment across the region. While these stats reflect a diversity across the region, it must be noted that some communities are much more reliant on mining than others. For example, the coal mines in Collie are the town's largest employer with approximately 16% of the town's jobs in this sector. As previously mentioned, the region is also blessed with a diversity of resources with a variety of minerals mined across the region. Southwest Hub membership is also particularly diverse. We have representatives from a range of sectors, including the mining sector, the MET sector, government, regional development organisations, Aboriginal representative groups and research organisations, and we thank them all very much for their input. As this slide depicts, expected mine life varies across locations and commodities. This presents some opportunities for transitioning workforces, although distances between the mine sites often makes them beyond an acceptable commuting distance. In relation to the journey so far, in 2017, the government committed $80 million to support the diversification of the Collie economy and the just transition of the mining and energy workforce. This commitment's brought about through the efforts of the long-standing local member for Collie Preston. The government also committed to a whole of government approach to the transition and provided funding to form a Collie delivery unit. The Collie Delivery Unit is made up of representatives from the Southwest Development Commission and the Department of Premier and Cabinet. And we also work really closely with the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development, the Department of Jobs, Science, Tourism and Innovation, Energy Policy WA, and the Department of Training and Workforce Development. The government have released two strategic plans for the transition, the Economic Development Action Plan for the Collie and Bunbury regions and Collie's Just Transition Plan. Both plans were developed with considerable stakeholder engagement and are delivered through a collaborative effort. The plans recognise the different roles stakeholders play and work and the importance of working towards a smooth transition. And they outline some shared vision, goals and priorities. I understand that the Shire of Murray and the Peel Development Commission have also worked through a process known as Dwelling Up Futures. This is 
This process is also about bringing together multiple stakeholders to define shared vision goals and strategic priorities. There are a significant number of opportunities that have been identified for post mining land uses. However, these don't come without the challenges. If I can just draw on the Collie experience once more, this is an image of Lake Kepori. This is a former Western Five open cut mine. It's two kilometres long, a kilometre wide, and up to 70 metres deep in places. It allegedly still has some mining equipment at the bottom. The government's committed $5.2 million to develop the facilities around the lake, which include a dual lane boat ramp, designated parking for boat trailers, a 21 campsite campground and sealed accessible pathways throughout the site. The current campsite opened in late 2020 and is regularly booked out. Stage two will see construction of a second campground to accommodate visitor demand with some works planned to commence in late 2021. Mining ceased at the site in 1996. Rehab work started in 2003. The first allocation of government funding to develop it as an aquatic recreation facility was in 2008 and it was officially opened in 2020. So that's approximately 24 years from closure to reopening with a new purpose. Hopefully through the work of the CRC time, we can learn from examples such as this to achieve the same results in a much more timely manner. More broadly across the region, we are working with communities to assist them to determine their future and based on existing infrastructure and worker skill sets, attract new and innovative future industries. I think I've now run well over time and I hope it's given you a quick overview of the Southwest landscape. Thanks for your time. As eagle-eyed of you might have noticed that there was a very small um, typo on one of those slides. It's actually Capel that's already closed um, in terms of mines. Um, I'd like to bring um, Pip and Fiona um, to the stage. And um, the reason is, is because this morning there was a lot of talk around um, from both Liz's and Fiona's presentations around the, the important role that government played in, in really driving that. Um, is there a lesson for other uh, regions in terms of how they can enable um, support? So is there um, anything that the other regions could do in terms of um, that key role that government really played in driving the Collie transition? Yeah, sorry, Emma, I thought your question was directed at Fiona um, and I couldn't see yeah. her on the screen. Um, yeah, I think the government has, when in the Collie context, the government has played a really key role in pulling all of the stakeholders together and um, keeping a lot of pressure on in terms of delivering the transition. Um, I think, in the Collie context that the, the state government effectively is owns the government trading enterprise that uses a large portion of the coal that is mined in Collie. So that link to the government, to the industry sector has actually meant that the government does have a key role to play. So um, yeah, I think that's, that, that is what meant that the government um, were very involved in that space and therefore they have had to play a leadership role. Great, thanks a lot, Pip. Um, the next question is for Peter Dowling, um, and it is um, in relation to the Enshom mine, could there be an argument that the local community does not accept the 2019 statutory reforms not applying to the Enshom mine voids? Yeah, thanks, Emma. That's an interesting question. Um, and perhaps start with an explanation of what those reforms are for the people that are not familiar. Um, no. They're legislative reforms that uh, Ensham as, an, as a mine has um, implemented around their environmental approvals. So in essence, um, they had some options there and the current um, outcome for them was to um, take the uh, Ensham voids back to a sort of an agricultural base. Um, there was a reference group that Ensham invest, invested in and uh, had many stakeholders involved that we're looking at the voids use going forward um, without speaking on behalf of all the, the uh, community representatives there. I think from a development perspective and from our local government perspective, we were probably still interested in investing in feasibility work to better understand the opportunities beyond regulation um, for that void to offer regional benefit. So on the Eastern side of Emerald where the mine is, 
there is a, an industrial development and there are agribusinesses there and water will be um, of great value to those. So we would like to see the opportunity of um, implementing some further research and feasibility into that potential of utilising water in the voids as a, um, as a reservoir. I think the challenge there is the um, what I would see as a positive precedent for regions um, would be um, challenged by the current legislations uh, and the thinking of um, different departments and agencies. So that's the challenge we have going forward with, in getting to that next stage of development for voids in particular. Thanks, Peter. And while I've got you there, I'll just ask another question. So um, you've obviously got a whole lot of coal mines in your area. And, um, there's a, uh, and, it's, and there's actually a lot, a huge amount of energy in the hub. So I'm really, really excited about um, the hub. And, and obviously they're seeing um, market and, and other pressures at the time. So uh, are there sort of examples of, um, I don't know, transitions that you're seeing? Um, there are, but it's not so much transitions out of coal at this point in time as, as much as transitions um, to other miners. So classically, we have seen some of our larger globals in the Bowen Basin, and they are still there, but some are transitioning out. There was a recent um, sale, for instance, from um, BHP Mitsui Corporation of two of their mines, and that has gone to a, a smaller miner um, called Stanmore Coal. So we are seeing more of those, um, what I'd call sort of uh, niche miners, some would call them junior miners, um, that are more active in our region. Um, from the perspective of um, the future of the commodity, um, the region is very pragmatic and very well aware of its future and the markets that, that are driving that. Um, I think that's yet to play out as to what that means practically on the ground. Thanks, Peter. Um, for this next question, I'd like to bring um, Michael Heap and Ray McKay um, to the stage, if you like. So um, if you can hear me, um, both of you sort of mentioned this issue of um, cumulative impacts. Um, and just looking at your two regions, you have a very interesting contrast, Pilbara. You have lots and lots of mines, um, lots of different stages of development, um, whereas Ray, yours is obviously you've got, you've got three mines, um, one commodity, um, it's sort of a lot simpler. So, um, I mean, cumulative um, impact is, is one example of, I guess, where you share some commonality. Um, so interested in exploring areas where you do share that commonality, as well as perhaps thinking about areas where it's very different and where you have very unique challenges. Um, I'll, I'll let either of you jump in. Um, I'm happy to start there. Uh, I guess for us, the, the, the biggest impact here is actually how do we uh, enable these all these opportunities to occur when uh, there is no workforce, uh, there is no availability of that workforce, and uh, if you could get them, there's nowhere to house them as well. So uh, that's the, the key for us is actually uh, how do we how do we activate these new industries at the same time as the existing mining is going to continue occurring and the additional mining of other minerals is going to continue occurring and actually physically get these people into the region that are, are required is probably our, our biggest concern. I, I imagine that's probably uh, one of the ones that's maybe unique to the Pilbara of your region, right? Okay, well, I'll, 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 I'll flick in here. Um, the, uh, for, for us, of course, the cumulative impacts are, are, are essentially environmental. Um, there are going to be social and economic impacts uh, because, of course, we're transitioning out of power uh, in this area, at least in terms of thermal power generation. But the three brown coal mines together actually have a very substantial cumulative impact on the region in terms of substance. They have a very strong impact on the region in terms of the regional water balances uh, and the uh, uh, impact on the way in which the uh, uh, Gibson Lakes in particular are uh, uh, likely to function going forward because they uh, um, have, have a potential to impact on, on the amount of water that will flow down to the Gibson Lakes. Yeah, that's certainly a commonality that we share in terms of the, the environmental impact 
Uh, a lot of the mining that will occur moving forward in the Pilbara will be yeah, below the water table and yeah, that, the, the impact on the water belt on the, on the level uh, will be significant, especially if additional water is being drawn for mineral processing, hydrogen production. Uh, there'll be a yeah, significant envir environmental impact to, uh, to, to understand better. Um, just on that water, um, on the water question, Ray, there was actually a specific question in the chat as well. Um, what are the main effects of the administration of the Water Act on the current operation of the coal mines and the proposed filling of the coal voids as pit lakes? So really around your Victorian Water Act. Okay. Uh, well, it perhaps a bit better start from the uh, position that uh, uh, each of the three brown coal mines are general, genuinely unstable. Uh, they have to be man managed for stability. So, without without managing for stability, uh, 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 we have we have a serious problem in terms of infrastructure and uh, uh, other uh, features of the region being in entirely impacted by the collapse of the mines. Um, each of the three brown coal miners are proposing uh, full pit lakes uh, to stabilise the mines and to make them sustainable. Uh, the Water Act comes in because essentially the water in this region is fully allocated. Uh, the um, entitlements that the power generators have uh, do not stretch to rehabilitation. So the moment that the power generators stop producing thermal power, uh, their entitlement to water uh, effectively ceases. And so they um, power operators will need to actually apply if, if they want to actually fill their um, mines with water, they'll have to apply for new entitlements to be able to do that. Um, the Water Act uh, and the Minister for Water has currently said that they can only apply for that water five years out from closure of the mine. And as we know, um, rehabilitation of a mine is a progressive process. You kind of need to know where you're going uh, and none of the miners are particularly keen to wait till five years out before they actually can get a, an agreement on what the final rehabilitated landfall will look like. So discussion around how we actually uh, uh, implement the Water Act uh, and how we deal with the issues of actually getting to an agreed landfall long before mining uh, ceases, uh, in, particularly in relation to the last two mines that we have. Um, Put that against the backdrop of uh, climate change, which is actually reducing the total amount of water. The uh, um, uh, land, water and planning uh, uh, group, of course, are very uh, clear that uh, that is likely to have a very substantial impact on uh, not only the uh, ability to rehabilitate mines with water, but also on existing uses elsewhere. So there's this competitive element between all the different potential future uses that um, rehabilitation using water-based approaches uh, would need to fit in with. So it's an interesting space at the moment. There's a lot of work going on at government level to actually unravel uh, those those questions. And uh, I'm pretty hopeful in about 12 months time, we might get some clarity. Sounds good, looking forward to it. Um, while you're there, there's another question that's just come up. Um, is there an incentive for investors to reuse the abandoned coal mine in Victoria um, and why pit lakes have been selected for repurposing? Is there any other viable application for the post mining land? Yeah, all of the um, uh, options are still on the table. Uh, so uh, we could complete these mines as empty uh, uh, mine voids. The issue that we have is that um, once we start to lower lake levels and decide that our final landform will be a lowered lake form or will be an empty void, we have an ongoing management cost. Um, currently, the mine operators individually spend between 20 and 30 million dollars a year, and that's a very rough number uh, to keep these mines stable. That wouldn't cease if we move to uh, uh, maintaining pits empty uh, into the future. Uh, so uh, any development of those mines um, 
that wants to look at a lowered lake form or a, uh, an empty pit scenario would have to take account of the costs of long-term management and maintenance for, for, for these pits. And uh, yeah, the figures are not small. Uh, so uh, you, you, if, if, you want, if you want to make an economic return um, without relying on government uh, subsidizing the costs of management, uh, then, uh, uh, then, then effectively, you, 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 you need to, to, to be able to actually make profits that will cover um, all the ongoing monitoring and maintenance costs. And of course, putting that alongside, there's a lot of infrastructure. So if failure risks are increased around the perimeter of the mine, infrastructure risks are also increased. And uh, yeah, things like road, uh, are the motorways that run past the mines, um, cost a significant amount of money to relocate if there if, if there's a substantial failure. Great, no, very good points. Um, that's all we have time for today. There was one other question which I might actually pose to everybody in the audience to uh, think about, I guess, going forward, which is how can the national government contribute to transitions where so much of the responsibility for key assets and processes lies within the state? So I'll leave you all with that question and um, then we'll, now we'll pass on to the next session.